Hello, welcome again to Sport Unlocked. As ever, if you hit subscribe, we'll land in your feeds automatically on whichever pod platform you're listening to us on. Joining me, Rob Harris from Sky News as ever, Martin Ziegler from The Times and Tarek Panja from The New York Times. Tarek, you've been out in Spain this week. Yeah, I was in Seville um, for for a, another one of these football summits or congresses or business meetings, whatever you want to call them. And also, I saw um, Seville play in the Champions League against Lens on Wednesday night. So, the same day. I must say, Rob, that's really two big parts of the football world. There's all these guys in suits talking about how much money they can make and revenue streams and all the weird gizmos and gadgets they want to sell. And then you go to watch Seville, stadium in the heart of the city, not a single corporate hospitality seat in that stadium. And probably one of the best atmospheres in Europe. I don't know if there's a correlation there, but it was incredible to hear the sound and, and see the sight of those Seville fans and the Lons fans, to be fair. They don't have any executive boxes or anything? Not a single one. And uh, funny enough, those at the conference were trying to, <laughs> partly there to try and get Seville to move towards the uh, the corporate world. And, um, you know, maybe some people would be sad to see. I think Seville are interested in, perhaps building a new stadium with with all of that stuff. Let's hope they don't lose what makes them such an attractive proposition in their own city. That crowd is just incredible. And on the opposite end of things, uh, Martin and myself, we're at a luxury London hotel where the Premier League clubs were meeting. Yeah, uh, we, we were. The um, Premier League clubs getting together to talk about the next big TV deal, which um, is important, not just, I guess, for the Premier League, but for the whole of football because the the richer the Premier League is, the the more the other European leagues um, kick off about it and feel that they're being left behind. So, yeah, well, I think uh, it's uh, things are shaping up to be quite interesting. One we'll get into a bit later in the pod. Here's something interesting that was announced: quite a serious case from Interpol. They broke up a criminal organised gang, in part they're involved in some match fixing and table tennis, but also they were finding a way of getting World Cup feeds early. So many people might not realise, but I certainly counted this when I was uh, out at the Women's World Cup in Australia. It takes about 15 seconds for the match action to be viewed on, particularly screens in the UK, because of all the HD and how long it takes to get across the world. And at the Men's World Cup in Qatar, this gang's accused of getting some early access, which then is feeding into the betting markets, and you can profiteer off that. That sort of thing has been going on for quite a long time. So uh, interesting that they're getting they're getting the feeds early. I mean, there has been quite a, f- a lot of things about spotters going into matches with a mobile phone um, and phoning you know, incidents um, back to um, whoever bookmakers, betters, um, to try and beat the, the broadcasters. I mean, there's a, there was a sort of fairly unpleasant case in in Newcastle. That, um, a few about ten years ago, but uh, a Chinese guy who was discovered dead, and it turned out he had been employed to go into matches, Premier League matches, with, with a mobile phone and phone information back. And obviously, there was concerns about links with organised crime. So it is, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's not not just football as well. I think um, tennis as well. There's this. Um, I think the term for these guys, the courtsiders, where they where they're sat in the stadium, and and that that split second or Rob, as much as did you say, fifteen seconds uh, advantage is 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 obviously uh, like having um, Biff Tanyan's Almanac in Back to the Future Two. If you've seen that film, where you where you get the sports results before they've happened, you're going to make a lot of money. Will you say that? And this is not to make money. That you know, particularly World Cup, I might often tweet a goal very quickly as it goes in, and you always get people saying, "We've not even seen anything close to that happening yet," as it's giving advance notice. Uh, and especially, actually, when you pe- more and more people watching via, via sort of internet um, connections, um, you really do have a significant delay then, and that can vary, can't it? I mean, sometimes you can be easily 15, 20 seconds, h- half a minute behind what the, the live action. In the Interpol um, case, have they provided any further detail into how these guys managed to get access to, to the... Um feed so quickly does that mean they tapped into uh, i guess whatever host broadcasting service there was in qatar at the time or or, or someone internally or anything like that 
Yeah, we haven't actually heard. It was just, you know, since they managed to sort of get this access to the feed. I suppose you could be doing it if you were in stadiums, but there's certainly a reference to how, you know, they did manage to gain significantly by taking advantage of the tiniest possible gap. So, yeah, we're waiting to actually hear some more on that case. The other thing, in some stadiums as well, if you try and get on a betting website, I don't think you can in certain certain arenas. You have a, a, a maybe some geolocation issues as well. That's that's another way of preventing some of this, but it's, it is really interesting. There's probably also money to be made in the virtual world of football too. Well, this week I was actually at the launch of the new EA Sports FC game. That might not be a familiar name for you because for 30 years it's been called FIFA. And... This all ultimately comes back down to some football politics, some decisions at the top of FIFA about why they walked away from their EA Sports partnership FIFA. So that much-loved FIFA brand in the gaming world has vanished. And crucially, when FIFA walked away, what, over a year and a half ago almost now, they said they'd have the biggest game still, they'd still have a FIFA game, but it's not there. It's not materialised. Gianni Infantino promised it, but there is no FIFA 24 game. And they're all partners. They're now rivals of got in ahead of them and you know an area we don't talk about as much here gaming but this is worth billions and how so many football fans access the game well it's fifa's highest um, revenue stream as well that's overnight switched off per, per year that ea contract was worth more than anything else fifa would generate at the time it was about 150 million dollars the number they turned down is around 200 million dollars to, to go it alone um and they didn't have to do anything for that either <laughs> you literally are saying here, have these four initials and, and, and off you go. And this other company, obviously EA has profited very well from one of the world's best sold computer games over the years. But for FIFA, that's gone. And also that positive name recognition, when you say FIFA, sadly for, for, for I guess, in most parts of the world, FIFA is, is negative, except when it came to that computer game. When I did a piece with Peter Moore, the former Liverpool um, chief executive, he used to work for EA Sports. So he sort of, fairly close and you, you might say he's also um, sort of has a certain viewpoint but I think he described it as the most expensive own goal in football history um, and John Infantino has promised that they're going to have the best football esports game um, but we still haven't seen any sign of that and it, it's very expensive very difficult and I think perhaps even impossible to sort of replicate what the now is EA Sports FC is going to, it does. And crucial to what EA Sports have done is deals with the big leagues, the Premier League, UEFA with the Champions League and so many other competitions like the Saudi League around the world, FIFA Pro as well. So they've managed to get the rights to all these players because one thing that came up in their focus group, someone from EA was saying, is that they thought it wouldn't be the real Cristiano Ronaldo, but they have the real names, they have the real teams. It's just you can't something like the FIFA World Cup. It's about the only property FIFA do re- retain. But if FIFA hope people would think actually EA would no longer be a superior product by launching now, they've managed to get that new name recognition probably with the fan base. And then it's quite a loyalty. Why would you necessarily buy this new FIFA game if it ever emerges? Yeah, I think having the, the rights to the actual names is, is critical. Um I don't. You remember there was a there was a rival um, to FIFA in the sort of the late noughties or the noughties, but because it, it didn't have the uh, the license, the names it had sort of like David instead of David Beckham, it was like Daniel Beckham. Pro, pro like Evolution, that, which uh, <coughs> it is indeed Pro Evolution Soccer, um, and uh, yeah, that I don't think that quite does it for most people most <laughs> want to pretend that they're actually whoever Bakayo Saka so EA's revenue is about seven billion dollars a year and they make more than a billion dollars a year alone from the ultimate team that's where you buy these packs that ultimately help you build the the star players and the star teams and it has come under criticism for some people for being a form of gambling in some markets but what the ultimate team notably has this time is uh, female players. So you can mix and match and you can have joint men's and women's teams. So they're also EA promoting it as this new form of equality. Though, of course, in the real world, FIFA wouldn't allow mixed uh, matches to take place. Wouldn't be the first, actually, EA. There was um, 
an owner of a Serie A club, I think in the late 90s or early 2000s, and he was a bit of a maverick. I, I forget the name of the club now, so I don't want to get that wrong. But he he, he wanted um, to, to promote a female player who said it was good enough to play in his Serie A team. Uh, but the league at the time denied that. He also signed, I think, um, one of um, the late Colonel Gaddafi's sons as well to, to play in his midfield. So that would have been a, 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 a you know an interesting double act there. Um, but yeah, uh, well done to EA. They, Rob, they've also started sponsoring a lot to get the name out. This is a big deal, right? Like to change this FIFA brand that was universally known and popular for two decades or more or three decades uh, so they've started sponsoring all sorts of things. I think La Liga is now the the EA EA uh, Sports FC La Liga, isn't it? Yes, it is. And the rebrand actually helps perhaps competitions like the Champions League. So you wait for no longer have to promote FIFA as a product as producing the game. It's EAFC that has the Champions League in it, which is a more neutral brand. EA have also been able to do deals with the likes of Nike to feature them in the game, whereas their partnership with FIFA restricts them because FIFA are very much Adidas, so it gives them that commercial flexibility. And they also talk about it becoming a football platform, so you get a sense they might want to turn FC into something that is beyond just gaming. Some suggestions will they start to show real live football from around the world as well. They have entered the real world because they've actually got some grassroots pictures in the game. So they've had a partnership in England with the Football Foundation, so you can play on those real grassroots facilities, which helps to promote actually the sort of lifeblood of football too. So potentially a a, um, a right buyer to be put on their own platform. Is that is that something that you kind of say is possible now with, with this? Yeah, they're trying to sort of build up the brand. We have seen uh, concerts aired live in some other games as well, haven't we? So it's very much sort of a, an entertainment destination rather than just being a game. Going back to the uh, Colonel Gaddafi's son. That, um, that was quite a segue, uh, unexpected a, on the pod. Unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> unexpected segue, uh, but because it's one of my favourite stories of all time. I think it was Berlusconi ordered Perugia, Perugia to sign that's him. it. Perugia. And then, <laughs> yes. and then he, uh, he he played 10 minutes of a match and then then he, I mean, obviously he was hopeless, and then he, <laughs> then he went to uh, um, Udinese. And I think it almost immediately failed the drugs right. test for steroids. Right. Well, it's hard to keep <laughs> up, isn't it? <laughs> well, of course, since we last recorded, we actually have the Paul Pogba doping case too in Italy. Yeah, he's uh, he's tested positive um, for testos- traces of testosterone, um, which, uh, I mean, it's uh, he's been having a, a pretty bad time anyway, isn't he? And I, I, I guess this is a... a as serious as it gets for him, really, because at his stage of his career, the Euro is coming up. Um, it doesn't look no, good. No, it's really sad what, what's happened. If you remember, um, his exit from Manchester United uh, wasn't great. He was injured towards the end of it. And then there was that affair with his brother when, when you know, he was accused of blackmail and extortion and you know the use of I think there was a witch doctor involved in this, and then there was criminal case filed in 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 France. Then he goes to Juventus, almost injured immediately. You know, hardly played a minute. A very expensive um, player on the books of Juventus, who are in financial trouble. I mean, it might suit them in a way um, that this has happened at the time because I'm reading that they want to potentially tear up his contract. So you know, just a sad situation for for, for Pogba. Um, and, and, and Juventus aren't in great shape either. Yeah, someone who I expect to might light up the game a bit more. Well, moving across to the United States, and that's where Gianni Infantino has spent the last week as we sort of start to build up to the 2026 Men's World Cup. And so much to get into, his trip to the United Nations with the President of Iran, meeting with all the US sports bosses and... Tarek, something you've been looking at, some of the challenges perhaps they're having with some of the, the host cities in the US. Yeah, there's been, I guess, a degree of um, confusion over the build-up and like a lack of clarity and, and direction from, from some of the reporting, um, you know, I've done. And this is, the, this is the first kind of men's tournament where FIFA has had this new model of being directly in control. 
Um, so this is across three countries, United States, Mexico and Canada, already confusing, 48 teams, biggest World Cup ever. And the national FAs, which normally are part of organising a World Cup, aren't involved at all. So FIFA are going direct to the cities, direct to um, the, the local governments, regional governments, uh, mayor's offices, and, and it's just nothing's really happened since 2018. Let's remember when they were awarded the World Cup. It was um, just um, on the eve of the Russia World Cup in 2018 in Moscow. Um, and there's been a not much progress made. And, and then this issue of FIFA saying they're going to take um, 11 billion, generate 11 billion, billion from the World Cup and from for these cities and these stadiums. It's like, well, what about us? Like, you can't just come here and take... Um, come to the US and just take everything away. We want to be equal partners. And, and that seems to be quite a, a sticking point. Um, and they've got this office in Coral Gables now in Florida where this World Cup we run from. And it seems to be very hard to hire staff. And Martin, they, they got rid of um, Colin Smith as well, the bloke who runs World Cups at FIFA, didn't they, um, a couple of months ago. So quite a lot of work ahead. Uh, I think you'll find that uh, he left on his own accord. Oh, there you go. Mutual, uh, mutual, mutual understanding. <laughs> Always one of those people you could put up a press conference who could be guaranteed wouldn't sort of put a foot wrong in anything they said. A very calming presence for FIFA. Yeah, they've got they've got a temporary guy in charge. Now. They still haven't decided where the final is going to be held. Are they? I mean, that's right. It's going to yeah. basically it's either going to be the Giant Stadium in New Jersey, which I think is probably the likely for time zones and. Um, also, I think they, I think the sort of feeling amongst the FIFA leadership, it's a sort of diverse city and a lot, sort of going to have a more of a buzz because the other option is, is Dallas, which is a sort of you know a, a very sort of clean, fantastic stadium. You know, got a roof that's so not going to be too hot, but it's a bit sort of I don't know. There's not much character around it, is there? So. I think it's probably going to be New Jersey, but I think it's very strange they haven't decided where the final is. Apologies to uh, perhaps any of our listeners in Dallas who might immediately be inviting you out there to get a better look of the city. <clears throat> I spent a month in Dallas, so uh, I know I know it quite well. So I was speaking with authority, it's, you know, it's it, it's um, <clears throat> it, it, it's a, you need to have a car to live there. That's for sure. I'm intrigued by this month in Dallas. You can't just just say that and then we're going to move. what did you what were you doing in Dallas for a month oh no, well I would say so my uh I, I have to be it wasn't quite a month but I uh, my uncle lived in Texas so when I was 18 I went and uh, spent time with him in Texas didn't fancy um, it didn't like it it's uh you know it's, I can see why people like Texas but it wasn't well not not for me uh, Rob, there is another city, by the way. We, we, it is it is going to be between Dallas and, and, and New York. But there was three cities that have submitted a bid for the, the final. Uh, Los Angeles is the other one. And that um, new stadium that Arsenal owner Stan Kroenke has built for his NFL franchise there. But Los Angeles for, for, it seems to be out of the equation completely. And it, as Martin said, it's um, between this really fancy Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys Stadium in Dallas uh, and the um, the MetLife Stadium in, and it's not New York, it's New Jersey, right? And that's another, that's another part of this, this, this question. We're, we're not talking about a, a final in the heart of New York. We're talking about it at the Meadowlands in, in, in New Jersey. Um, but, but that, as, as you said, New York is New York and it's going to be a week of events around the final um, and, and, the weekend of the final is going to be a big deal. It's not just a game anymore, is it? So they're going to need all sorts of um, other entertainment around it. And, and that, weirdly, that's one of the pluses for Dallas. The footprint around the Cowboys Stadium is, is enormous and, and you can do a lot more around there. But, you know, if I was betting, oh, I'd probably say New York as well, wouldn't you? Because it's such a big capital, you know, it's such a Far more accessible for fans coming from around the world, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's New York. Just to mention about the uh, the Sophie Stadium in Los Angeles, I mean, of course, <laughs> it was this crazy idea that uh, was well, not crazy, crazy planning that, despite having been told about the possibility of it being a a, a World Cup final um, possibility, they, they they didn't make the pitch big enough. So 
you know, it's, there's a, if they wanted to host the final, they'd, they would have to basically spend lots of money alter, altering the actual inside of the stadium. But won't they have to do that if they have to host any World Cup games? I mean, they're, they're on the hook for millions of dollars regardless, right? Yeah, well, no, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Bring back the Rose Bowl. That'd be pretty hot. No yeah, roof yeah. at all on the stadium. Get Diana Ross. <laughs> Diana Ross. It is a very, very uh, picturesque arena, though. Yeah, but it, obviously it's going to be baking hot. But um, if you've ever been there, it's a gorgeous location. It's the mountains in the background. But anyway. And Johnny Fantini has been busy, as we said, out in the States with the various commissioners all saying they're going to have the most diverse World Cup ever, of course, the first with 48 teams. So it's going to be enough games to get through in the States. And he's also been at the United Nations seemingly trying to sort of get encounters with anyone who would meet him uh, so in terms of world leaders from Iran to Croatia as well. Yeah, he met the WTO uh, leader there as well. And um, he's one of the hallmarks of the Gian- Gianni Infantino presidency, I think, has been that kind of desire to be in close proximity to statesmen and stateswomen, the people who run the world. And I guess the week of the UN General Assembly, it's like, um, oh, I could do have all these photo opportunities, I guess, and meetings in, in, in one spot. So, so, you know, have at it. He's been there most years and he attends the G20 now, uh, seemingly on a, on a you know, um, regular basis as well. Yeah, does he want to? Does he get called Mister President at these things? Do you think? He didn't get me to know with uh, America's chief diplomat, did he? At the uh, the Qatar World Cup. Yeah, uh, heard that um, during the Qatar World Cup, the US had sent their um, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken to the to the World Cup to follow the US team, and he was busy doing exactly that, following the the, the, the US team, and didn't have an opportunity or the time to, to get together with Gianni Infantino. I'm sure there'll be chances to have that photo taken at, you know, another moment or, you know, maybe this week in New York. FIFA's very own former UN insider, Fatma Samora, wasn't at the UN General Assembly. She was actually where you were in Spain. It was such a big appointment because, let's remember, this was after the FIFA scandal and they had to redraw the, the statutes or the rules that FIFA is run by and it would have meant that the, her role even on paper is what the most powerful secretary general in FIFA history, the most powerful CEO, if you want, in some ways more powerful on paper than the president himself. But that's not how things have gone. Fatma Samura, first woman, first African and uh, first Muslim to be in, in, in this role. I don't know, seven years later, when you, you look at her role and what she's done, she's pretty much been sidelined. In that time, nearly $15 million in salary. Good luck to her for that. It was to my surprise that at this conference I was at, she was being awarded with a, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and But they didn't list any of these awards. Who was making this, who was making this award? Ah, well, this is where it gets even more kind of uh, interesting, I guess. She was interviewed... Uh, <laughs> at this event in Seville by um, the head or the owner of a company called APO, which is a big African communications company, which completely coincidentally and nothing to do with this award, I'm told, is also a big client of FIFA. So it distributes quite a lot of their information and has done and has been um, obviously paid handsomely for this during... Um, uh, the last few years, during the years Fatma Samora has run FIFA. But these two things must be seen separately, Martin. I don't know what you're getting at here. What we're told she has helped to oversee is an improvement in the distribution of money from various various projects around the world, from FIFA funds, and improve the compliance after perhaps the lack of rigour from the previous FIFA era. But that's what we're told. We haven't actually seen any detail. We don't hear her talking about it. They've never held a briefing with her to discuss that and that's the question is it the FIFA machinery that actually suppresses her voice and her status and everything she's done because we don't get a chance to see her at press conferences or actually 
to talk about the role. And very often it's still talked about to her being appointed into the role in 2016 rather than actually what she's been doing in it. Yeah, I mean, she's completely different to her predecessor, Jerome Velk, who had, played, had a very, very sort of hands-on active role, was a sort of spokes, spokesman for FIFA, um, if set Blatter wasn't available. Often, and so, it, yeah, it's completely different to that. Our own engagement, always very uh, welcoming, friendly, and, you know, engaging on that sort of casual level as we encounter these people around various FIFA events. But the two, two million dollars a year in a salary might, <laughs> I don't know, does that does that mean that, you know, you don't want to raise your head above the parapet because, you, you know, you never know if you're ever going to earn that sort of money again? Well, perhaps her final sort of few weeks will be more of a chance to hear from her about everything uh, achieved at FIFA. Certainly one of the challenges still for the global game is very much on the treatment of women in sport. And that's been drawn into wider attention by the Luis Rubiales scandal in Spain. You know, Gianni Fantino at the UN hasn't sort of used that moment for anything bigger on female empowerment, sexism within the sport and making a stand in that way. Yet over a month on from that World Cup final, the fallout is still continuing in Spain very nearly you know, we had the Spanish players boycotting their first game since the World Cup. It seemed like they were almost being corralled into reporting for national team duty under the threat of sanctions under Spain sports law, which can fine and ban players if they don't turn up to national team duty. But eventually they did re- report to duty. They, you know, have used their position really notably, haven't they? Calling for sweeping changes. Rubiales going isn't enough. Now we've had the Secretary General going as well from the, from the Spanish FA and perhaps some hope of a more welcoming environment. But, I mean, there are so many strands to this story, aren't there? League players, the domestic league players, domestic league F, um, that go on strike for, for more pay, the minimum pay of €15,000 a year, thought was was, was sort of pathetic. Um, so there's definitely been an empowerment. There's you know, lots of people talked about this as sort of Spain's Me Too moment. So there have been huge repercussions and positive repercussions, you have to say, generally. Um, and it's not just in Spain. It's sort of like sort of gripped the world. Uh, kind of um, a defining moment and one that obviously has heralded change in Spain, but it might bring people forward to to speak up who might have been fearful in the past now that you see these kind of um, dinosaurs being stripped of their roles in football and you, you have changed. One of the things I noticed before the Spanish team ended their strike, they said um, a statement saying they, even after Rubiales was fired, that they still didn't want to, to play um, because there were structural issues. And almost... If you read past the language, said so the, there should be a federation in a way that is completely focused on on this Spanish women's game and that cares solely about that. And it made me think again about whether, even on an international level, women's football should be run solely and with that focus by people who really care about it are not distracted by all this other. Um, sort of big business, big money and all the distractions of the men's game that is sort of ramped up next to it. And, and I've been talking to people um, in the game um, over the last few weeks and there is some now a little bit more um, thought about maybe that might be a good idea and there are ways to do it. And I kind of suggested in the past um, a 20% levy or tax on FIFA, which you know we've talked about 11 billion over the next four year cycle. For, for a couple of decades, that is great seed money. In fact, would make it one of the world's most um, wealthiest sports federations overnight if you set up an international women's football federation. And maybe it's because the Men's World Cup makes more money for FIFA at the moment. That That's why we've seen Gianni Fantino in the US in the last week, although not in Mexico and Canada, the other co-host for 26, where, of course, he spent less time and attention to making trips to the Women's World Cup hosts ahead of uh, the tournament there. This year, he didn't go to Australia at all before the um, uh, Women's World Cup, if, if you if you recall that. And you're right, he was in Dallas, 
um, this weekend at an NFL game with Jerry Jones, the owner of the stadium, who's hoping to bring the final there. Saw him on the jumbo screen um, there and uh, a stadium visit because it is so, obviously in his eyes, very paramount where, where the World Cup final is played. And that, as you said, Rob, is, is a contrast. One notable achievement might be symbolic to some, but it's important, is this Spanish team securing a name change. So no longer are they known as in Spain and the Federation, the Spanish women's team, but all the Spanish teams are known as the Spanish uh, team. So men's or women's, there isn't that demarcation for the women's team because, of course, at the moment, we still have the FIFA World Cup is for men and the women's World Cup is women. So the gender is only highlighted on, on the women's tournament. Yeah, no, that's probably a, a good change too. Martin, another big change that you, you've you seen is this sudden interest and in growth in the Saudi Premier League all of a sudden. And you've got some great stats as to how huge their attendances are now um, post this big spending summer. Yeah, the sort of press release came out from the Saudi Pro League saying the they've got record, record attendances, huge growth from last season. Um uh, actually, uh, when I worked out what the average attendance was for a Saudi pro, uh, pro league uh, game, the average attendance is, is only eight thousand, um, which is, you know, from an uh, English point of view, <laughs> seems very very small. <laughs> and you can looking at some of the pictures, like from when Jordan Henderson was playing, um, it was, you know. Lucky if they could actually get to a thousand in terms of the number yeah. of people in the stadium. Yeah, it, it's it's very skewed, isn't it? Because you have, um, you know, regional heavyweights there, well supported teams like Al Hilal regularly getting more than 40,000. That's where, um, even before all these players were signed, um, now they have Neymar and um, Alexander Mitrovic and, and the others there, etc. But so if you take Al Hilal at one end, there was um, a stat or someone was suggesting that if you add the entire season's attendances of the, the, the kind of bottom four in terms of attendance, they still would not get one game's worth, so about 41,000 for an entire season if you add all their games together. Um, and it's quite a strange way, um, very skewed league in, 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 in that sense. Um but but it's a I guess it's a TV product and a, and a marketing product. And one of the, one of the things they mentioned, guys, in Seville, was they don't mind if people aren't watching the ninety minute games. They want this kind of regular engagement clips and social media posts, and as such, almost give away their rights to to these players, very famous people, um, to post videos and content on on their personal um, social media feed. Something that you can imagine top leagues allowing free video to just disappear, right? Yeah, and we heard from the man at the top himself this week, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, who asked on Fox News about sports washing. Well, if sport washing is going to increase my GDP by 1%, and then I will continue doing sport washing. <laughs> You're okay with that term? I, I, I don't care. I have 1% growth of GDP from sport, and I'm aiming for another 1.5%. Call us whatever you want. We're going to get that 1.5%. I'm not quite sure how it increases GDP, though, doesn't it? Because it's not bringing in money, is it? Uh, how can sport... It seems to be costing them a lot rather than uh, generating yeah. cash. Yeah. I suppose there'll be some money coming in from F1 and, and boxing, but actually it's a sort of... Surely it's a sort of net spend, but I don't know. But also, I suppose, um depends what we count as the sports industry there, you know, in terms of... The opening up of Saudi society, people are able to do a lot more. So you know, you practice sport, you you, you play, you pay, you spend money on going to things. Um, but like you say, you haven't seen the books, have we? <laughs> and obviously, the Premier League are trying to assert their dominance still globally as the league people really want to watch and to to play in. And perhaps that's borne out with some of the TV deals that they're doing now, the international TV deals, which are. Showing growth, aren't they, globally? Uh, making more money from international rights than domestic rights, the Premier League, and only on the up with now another new deal where Canal Plus, wh wh which territories are these in? Do we know how much it's worth? Um, so they are, they used to have 
um, France, Czech Republic and Slovakia. So they, they, they've got those and they've also got Switzerland and Vietnam um, from 2025 to 28. So I'm not sure what the actual sum is, but it is around about a 10% uplift. And what that means is that the total um, total overseas income from the Premier League for 2025 to 28 is already higher than for 22 to 25. 22 to 25 was 5.5 billion pounds. So they, they're already there and they've got some more territory still to still to conclude agreements. So um, it's definitely looking higher on that and be interesting to see what happens with the domestic rights. That's about 5 million. They haven't sold theirs for since back to 2017, I think was the last time they did that. Um, because of COVID, they were allowed to extend the existing deals. So, yeah, but it does look to try and get at least the same, if not more, they're putting a lot more matches up for, for live broadcast. Uh, so, at the same time, I noticed Serie A's TV problems seem to be going on. Uh, it looks like they might not get more than 700 million euros a season for their domestic contract. Martin, what's the Premier League's domestic deal? With, with so Stein? it's five, 5 billion or 5.1 billion over three years. So That's the domestic um, one? Domestic, yeah. Wow. So, wow. Uh, Almost That's double, double, double Serie A. More, so, than, more than double. More, 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 than, more than, double. than double, right. Yeah. So um, I got myself into a, an unfortunate scrape this week on social media by saying that um, Newcastle may have faced a tougher examination of their credentials by playing Brentford at the weekend um, because they uh, before their Champions League opener with AC Milan, the great and vaunted historic wonderful team of AC Milan, the club. The point I was making is this, that what you've just said, now we've got even more money coming in. Brentford and all the other teams in the Premier League are able to outspend any other team or most other teams in Europe for for players that they want, certainly when it comes to salaries. Um, It it didn't go, my point didn't go down very well with with, with fans of AC Milan. But, But I think the point needs to be made that, you know, the Premier League is is running so far ahead when it comes to generating this cash and then spending it on on um, paying talent that the marketplace for players is is going to be skewed. And AC Milan, for as much as we love them for that history, that playing in the San Siro, the romantic nature of it, and, and lots of other teams in, in Serie A, not just them, are going to find it harder and harder to compete for talent. Yeah, they are. Um... There's still, I think there's going to be, there probably be between 260 to 270 um, live Premier League games domestically from 2025, which is up from 200 this season, which would be the biggest rise in, in the number of live matches um, that since the, the league was launched. Um, so it, it is, it is going to be basically a lot more sort of wall to wall, which I probably hope to. See, there'll be more money, um, but also interestingly, they, it's going to have an impact on the, the lower divisions, the EFL, because they, they've reached basically a broad agreement on the amount of the extra cash that the three divisions below the Premier League are going to get, an extra around about 130 to 140 million a year. It's, gonna, it's not going to be the same every season, but that's on average. Um, they're just having disagreement still over the spending controls, which uh, which is. So that this is an ongoing deal, which is in the background of a football regulator coming in. Um, they're still having discussions, but I think we, with, at least in terms of the money, the agreement's been reached. And the hope is from the government side to get this agreement so the regulator wouldn't have to step in to come to a deal between the Premier League and the EFL with a lot of focus on just what the power of the football regulator in England would be. And something we discovered in the last couple of weeks is the fact that it wouldn't have the power to recommend sporting sanctions anymore to um, punish clubs. It wouldn't be recommending financial sanctions. And of course, a lot of fans are wondering just how much scrutiny will it have over new owners? No regulator yet in place for the Everton takeover, which is ongoing from this 777 group of which uh, an Everton fans are desperate for new ownership to end the Farhad Mashiri era and to bring more cash into the club. But a 777, the right new owners well so people who don't know much about 777 they they own several american investment firm 
owned several football clubs. Um, Hertha Berlin, they've got Standard Liège in Belgium, Red Star in France, Barcelona de Gama, de Gama in Brazil. Um, and the, uh, basically the model is they've, uh, the club, giants of football who've fallen in hard times, I think they you know, get them for a knockdown price, build them up again and then sort of make a huge profit. I guess that's the idea, except it hasn't got quite uh, that easy. And they've sort of run into cash flow issues. Um, that's for sure. But interestingly, they also own the British Basketball League or co-own it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I saw that they, there's been huge problems there. And the chairman of British Basketball League, Sir Rodney Walker, two weeks ago sent 777's um, founders, Josh Wanda and Steve Pascoe, an email saying that their failure to make payments on time has taken the British Basketball League to the brink of administration. Um, so this is clearly something the Premier League is going to look at. I mean, Rodney Walker has told me since that they've promised to pay up by the end of September and that he's in a much happier place. But I think if you're taking over like one of the oldest clubs in the world, um, the Premier League is going to be, want to make absolutely sure that the, it's not sort of out of the frying pan into the fire. What are 777 saying when you put this to them? So they, they're not talking about, they said they won't say anything more about the Everton takeover um, until it happens, but they have said that they are, you know, they, they are investing in, the British Basketball League, league ahead of schedule. Um, they've not explained why the payments were late, but they say that they're, they're fully committed to it and they've made this payments that initially it was going to be over a, a longer periods. But I suppose you, there are questions about how if you're struggling to make an £820,000 payment, um, on one hand, the same company is going to spend hundreds of millions in taking over a football club. Well, are they going to spend hundreds of millions on taking over a football club? I mean, my, my looking at Everton's very crudely with the stadium and all the various debts and all of that, you arrive in there at minus 500. Now, my, I, I would love to know how much actual money is going to change hands um, when it comes to purchase price. You know, is it a, more than a packet of crisps and a bottle of Lucozade? Is it millions? You know, I, I, I just can't imagine with the, the kind of pain that you immediately walk into in terms of liabilities, what you're going to give Farhad Moshiri for the 750 million. And the thing is, it would help if these people spoke. I know you were saying, well, they're not saying anything because of whatever, whatever, until it's done. Well, they've made it public, Everton and these people that they have a deal. The only headlines around these people have been largely negative. Um, we've got all of these questions about this company, 777, and Pasco and Wanda, with all of that swirling, you would have thought, with, with, these, with these Everton fans, these poor Everton fans who've had gone through it all for however many years, that someone would put their you know, head above the parapet and start talking, given that they were so happy to announce that a deal has been um, reached. Why is no one talking about this? Why have they not got someone to represent them? Yeah, it's a good question. It is a good question. Um, you're right. It may not be that very little money changes hands. They just take over the debt, um, which is a similar thing that happened at Hertha Berlin. So the, at Hertha Berlin, they, they lent them 50 million euros in advance. Um, and then they, I think they only paid 15 million, another 15, one five million euros to actually take over the club from the German entrepreneur whose name escapes me. But um, so they actually. Uh, Lars Windhorst. Yes, thank you. And um, so that wasn't a, a, a big sort of upfront spend. So uh, uh, reading the reports this week, they, they have already lent 20 million pounds to Everton. So maybe it's the same model is going to follow. I think all the clubs, if you look at all of them, the, the whole suite of clubs you've mentioned, I think Genoa as well. And um, I think the purchase price often was hardly anything. It's to take over these clubs that are in financial disarray. Um, and, and then, as you said, I don't know what, what alchemy they plan to do with them. But the risk is, 
that all of these great clubs, if this goes wrong, um, you know, at risk of, 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 of worse than the situation they found themselves in before these guys came in. And Everton building new stage with all the debt that entails as well. Yeah, absolutely. Except I suppose that is a very attractive thing to sort of, that probably is the most attractive thing about Everton in that you, you know, once the stadium is done, it can become a sort of cash cow. I've heard something like it should be an increase on £65 million a year um, on Goodison Park. Um, so I suppose that must be a, a pretty attractive well, wait to see what happens with that takeover. Tottenham this week, Chairman Daniel Levy telling Bloomberg their open investment. The Manchester United takeover saga drags on too. Does it? What's happening with that? We haven't had a Manchester United takeover saga update for a while. What? What? What is? What is? What is the latest on, on that thing? Well, we can just build a pod as Manchester United sale updates, and it might get all those uh, Manchester United listeners uh, staying for forty-five minutes plus to to get the update. Are you saying we're in the clicks business now, Rob? I think the update is, uh, I think it is that the, the, the sale process continues. The, um, they are open to offers. Um, one side is hopeful and uh, so is the other. We, ha- we haven't had a deadline for a while. Is there a deadline coming? <laughs> what number? I think we might have reached sixth deadline. And on, on terms of Tottenham as well. Um, Final just- bids as well. Yeah, final bits. Just, just, just to remind people. I mean, Levy obviously has, has said they're open to investment. We've we've all kind of reported on this as well in the past that there were talks with the Qatari Investment uh, Fund earlier this year as well. That didn't materialise into anything. So Tottenham obviously um, open to offers. The other thing from the Bloomberg interview that I thought was quite interesting was he was saying that a naming rights partner for that wonderful new stadium they've built is now not essential because it seemed as part of the business plan for for building the Tottenham Stadium. There was going to be um, a requirement or, or they, they, they um, budgeted for a, a naming rights partner and they might not go down that road now. Um, obviously, Arsenal did it with the Emirates. So that's that's something new, Rob. Yeah, Daniel Lee was saying they see more value now in actually promoting the Tottenham name around the world associated with the stadium rather than perhaps a lesser deal as the the sport on lot name goes all around the world with our many global listeners yeah anyone any anyone in mongolia this week now we see we are pretty big in paraguay where common ball are obviously based so the main thing is keep hitting subscribe on your pod platform then we land automatically and get notifications and the like and always mesh any feedback through sport on lots on twitter facebook and instagram Sorry, I'm in default mode. Twitter, it's X now, isn't it? But everyone knows hopefully what we're talking about. As ever, thank you for listening and goodbye for now. 